Hello there, everyone. Welcome back to some more Let's Play Cold Chronicles. In the last episode, Sarah Anawa began exploring the mansion. We are redoing this after my tweaking of the game files. I'm pretty sure now has somehow messed up the way edge upgrades work. So I've reset all the edges back to their normal base game files. This should hopefully correct that issue, and now we are testing it by choosing Sarah Anawa again, the same type of build, and I will try my best to select all the same type of edges during our leveling up process. This way, I can verify that it's been fixed, our issue. Well, I'm kind of lucky for that, though, very lucky for that, but hopefully that will be the case. So we started the last episode, and we are looking at 18 sanity and 13 life. We didn't gain or lose any life whatsoever. Our sanity was quite a wild ride. We went down to 7 at one point, which is, that's the danger zone. You could, if you have a new encounter, you could easily lose 7 sanity if you fail the horror check, and then the encounter goes bad. So thankfully, we have regained back up to 18 there. We also got lucky with quite a bit of experience points in the last episode. We have now three in all our stats, increasing our pentacles by uh, one point. And now we are working on increasing our swords to four. We also, as you can see, grabbed another skill card, taking Hyperborean Sorcery Specialist again. We found a single clue token as well, and we also acquired quite a few quests, which is very nice for Sarah, given her low stat spread at the beginning of the game. All right, let's pick up where we left off. Hello, music room. You see a magnificent grand piano in front of you. The hairs on the back of your neck begin to stand on end. You feel a presence nearby. Streams of psychokinetic energy are leaking from the piano. You can hear a wailing plea in your mind for help. Some supernatural entity possesses the piano. You brace yourself for its psychic impact. You can see the psychic waves roll towards you. You steady yourself to withstand its shock. Ah, decent hand. Assuming we can get use our king. Now we can to prevent ourselves taking Sandy Loss. Nice! And we got to use our Knight of Wands. You deflect the fear that would have sought to dominate and consume you. The Grand Piano seethes before you. Something seems wrong here. You sense that a curse or fell sorcery has imprisoned two spirits here. One acts as jailer to the other. You can in fact hear the captive plead for release in your mind. You remember a lecture during your odd training about Plotinus' theory on spirit traps. Some cursed items used a spirit to effectively bind another spirit to its existing nexus with our world. Such spirit traps could snowball out of control given the chance. Perhaps you can free both before it's too late. So this is part of a... We can't... I think this can give us a quest. But I'm... No, this is a second This is a second part of a quest. I think. In either case, I do not have the stats to get the quest from this piano. So we'll return to it later. By the way, you can usually tell if something is a quest target. Given by the incredibly high difficulty it takes to actually uh, do one of the challenges normally. Like, like an 11 target level to dis destroy the piano physically. Also, to my my knowledge, these are never, it's never ever really worth doing these unless you're very short on time, like the story tokens are running out and you're just, you desperately want a chance at a little more experience or something of the sort. Because to my knowledge, all these encounters do not give you anywhere near the type of rewards you can get from completing the quest that they're tied to. So I'm imagining this must be the composer, the or the organ. Or a gong! You see a large wooden brass gong. It looks completely out of place standing over by itself in the room. You sense immediately that not all is as it seems here. You've seen enough of these things to notice the faint aura that surrounds it. You have no doubt that the gong is a sorcerer's puzzle of some sort. The markings are vague, but you would place it around the period of the Three Kingdoms. There is definitely dark magic at work here. The runes covering the wooden frame must contain the instructions on how to use the gong to access its abilities. The thought of all that noise scares you. The fact that you have no idea what will happen if you do sound the gong scares you even more. I think we need a four pentacles to actually interact with that. It might be four wands, but I'm pretty sure it's four pentacles. Hmm. 
And this is probably some papers, would be my guess. Yep. You see a bunch of papers spread out on top of a desk. Among the clutter are an assortment of old envelopes, letters, and even a few parchment papers. So, I would like at least one more pentacles, preferably one wands and one pentacles. So, we won't interact with this at the moment. We'll come back for this. You don't want to bother with this right now. A billiards room. I really like this room, the way it's drawn, because you can tell that, like, or at least I think, there was a body placed on the covering of the of the pool table here most likely it was cut open by the cultists here all right we didn't we didn't talk about uh what what's going on here so we are investigating this place sent here by the odd to investigate the cult of the tentacled ones which is rumored to be here our contact was a member of the cult that sarah anawa i suppose used to be a part of both him and her both left the cult uh in order well in order to join the odd or perhaps Perhaps we didn't willingly do so, but we did so after the Odd offered us a position in it rather than killing us. The Cult of the Red Hand was the group I we're going to go with that, that Sarah was a part of. We have discovered that a member of the Cult of the Red Hand at least was playing a game, and then a demon that he summoned told us that he believes that Cultus is now dead. You come face to face with the living dead! Slow, ponderous, and mindless zombies are still not to be underestimated. They can overwhelm you with numbers and be feasting on your entrails before you know it. Despite having dispatched quite a few of these undead automatons, they still creep you out. Not today, they don't. Not today, they don't. You finally remember your last mission with Officer Rick. It was utter zombicide. Zombies! You hate these guys. This place certainly knows how to keep you on your toes. Let's open the summer house here. And, ooh. This is all tricky. The numbers are so close between fleeing and attacking, I'd rather just attack at this point. Because if we flee and fail, we lose courage. Uh, we, we, we still take hits. So I'd, I'd rather just fight, because then at least we won't lose courage for the encounter. Now, granted, our, our heroic feat... Um, that r the charge, reckless charge, you're not going to see me use it until later in the game because we don't have that many tricks on the board and I really can't afford to take double wounds, whatever that means. But I still don't want to lose courage for it. The reason why you also won't see me use it is because it only affects non-revealed numbered cards. So until I have more cards on the trick table, I don't feel it's worth using it. The more cards, the more the odds are, the, well, the more you will benefit from using Reckless Charge. So we're going to hold off on using it until we have, like, at least eight trick cards on the table. See? We didn't even need to use it. Ah, look at all. The dismembered zombie body still twitch around on the floor, putting on quite the show. One thing I do wish the game did was show you what the results were of all the cards that you didn't flip over. I'm still, I still to this day, do not know if the cards as, like, the cards are placed and whatever they contain, they contain. Like, just like how we scry trick cards, for example, we can see that they're what card it that was placed there. Or, if all the cards are completely empty, and it decides to right then and there when you flip the cards over what the result will be. Oh, I don't like this hallway. I suspect there will be insects in this hallway. We didn't encounter anything that would block our progress on the other one. This is this hallway is too empty. <laughs> you notice that the floor in front of you seems to be moving. You step closer, thinking that it must be some sort of optical illusion. Suddenly, you step on something, and it makes a squishing noise. You look down and see a writhing carpet of insects covering the floor. Scattered around the insects are the bones of their victims. You've never seen so many insects together all at once. Waves seem to undulate across an ocean of insects. The patterns are almost mesmerizing. You get a very bad feeling looking at this. It makes you afraid. 
doesn't make us afraid. We're okay. You would think things far worse than this. After all, you spent two weeks at the Odd Survival School eating bugs and some other things you would rather not think about. I like to think that the cult of the Red Hand had, that was some sort of ritual, so Sarah was actually used to eating insects. You count dozens of different species and wonder why they would all be gathered here together. The bones indicate a food source of some sort, but you wouldn't expect so many different types. Centipedes, cockroaches, ants, spiders? If you want to keep moving down the corridor, you're going to have to step on or over them. So, based on where this is located, my guess is that we could retreat... We could we could retreat and take the stairs up to the other side of the hall of the mansion. But I would rather avoid stepping upstairs unless I absolutely must. Now, we could try fleeing the encounter, and I think if we actually pass this challenge very well, we actually get to stay where we are rather than being forced back a step. There's a door here, so I wouldn't mind opening it to see what room is over there, though I don't plan on going into it. So I, uh, I might be wrong about this though. This might the only result of this might be to step back. Oh uh, yeah, actually I think this is the case. I think no matter what happens, no, this is a flea. So if you pass this check high enough, you should be able to do exactly that. Let's try, let's try this. So we're gonna try fleeing, and assuming we get a high, if we score five over the target number. That should hopefully allow us to actually stay here. And we have gotten five over the target number. Quite a bit over it, nine over it actually. You back away from the massive colony of bugs, watching your steps so that you crush as few as possible under your feet. Oh, this is a flea. Uh, we shouldn't flip over any cards. And we do, in fact, get to stay here. Okay, that's what I thought. So then it's never really worth it to do the... Well, hold on, it is. Because I think if you try to step over the insects and you succeed, the cards you flip are not flea cards. They're successful challenge cards instead. So you could actually get, like, health or sanity. And as we saw, I think, in the last video, I think we... No, that was the plank we crossed and we gained an edge upgrade, not the insects. Oh, the nursery. The <coughs> the baby we need to kill for the gluttony demon might be in here. There might be children in here as well. And there might be porcelain dolls in here. The children and dolls would be for another quest. It's tempting to go in here, but I don't think we actually have the stats to beat the baby. That's so weird to say out loud, but I'm pretty sure that's correct. So we'll we'll move on. Hello, Mortalis Rati are here. I suppose that makes sense. The tentacle ones, like the Cthulhu and what have you, they are just giant alien creatures. It's not like they're demons or devils. Right, like the Migo come from another galaxy, another planet in another dimension. So the Talos Rati would be very fitting to have set up shop here. Maybe they're helping the cultists down below bring the Tentacled One out into this world. Oh, or I could be wrong, and it's Ben Holloway instead. Uh, sorry, Dr. Laszlo Benway instead. You see a strange man hunched over a work table that is cluttered with blueprints, tools, gadgets, and colorful test tubes. He barely takes any notice of you at first, as if he had frequent visitors to his laboratory, which you find highly unlikely. You recognize the man from his odd file almost immediately, Dr. Laszlo Benway. What could he possibly be doing here? There was obviously some strange convergence that's attracting the most notorious and nefarious characters and supernatural entities to this place. Oh, we have a decent chance to talk with him. Let's try it. Oh, I didn't read that, that card. Strange bedfellows? He's not your primary target, so maybe he will be willing to assist you. I think something like that is what it said. We only have one good card here. We have two aces, a two, and a four otherwise. We have a queen of pentacles, which we can use immediately to win the challenge. Do I want to do that? No, I'll, I'll fail. You clear your throat. You tap on the table. Hello, McFly. Anybody home? I haven't got all day, Benway. He studiously ignores you. 
the insult stings. <laughs> wow, we lost three sanity to that. Was expecting that to be so bad. Okay, let's try this again. This is better. We have a queen and a king. We will use the queen. Actually, we'll use the seven. I'm, I'm taking a risk here, Tim. No, use the queen. Win the challenge. Hopefully, you'll get a pentacles card up here. We do. Okay, so that worked. So, I wanted a higher... Uh, I want to score high over our target number because there is a chance, however slim, that you can get experience points for actually accepting the quest. You clear your throat to look Benway straight in the eye when he glances up. You know from his facial expression the recognition that you are an odd agent, and his faintest hint, and the faintest hint of a smile crosses his face. Yes, I think you'll do just fine, he says. Come on, game. You're making a liar out of me. Your arrival is most serendipitous. I have a task for you. You shall be rewarded, of course. Benway wants you to find his lab refrigerator, which also happens to be this house's only refrigerator, located naturally in the kitchen. Fetch the small jar labeled Boffin Juice, and return it here at once. Hmm. Okay. Uh, what I said was going to show up in here, the porcelain dolls, the kids dancing, and the baby. They could also be in the children's playroom instead. At first, they look like small reflections of light playing off the floor from the room from the moon. They appear to dance and circle around the room, which upon further consideration seems very odd. Then you notice that you are observing the ghosts of four children playing merrily by themselves. The quiet serenity of the deathly scene is shocking. These children don't seem to realize that they are dead. Your mind is overwhelmed by the utter sadness of the scene. How long have they danced through these empty rooms and halls? You fight to keep your sanity from slipping away. Oh. We don't have a good hand for this. We might get lucky if a low wands card shows up. You start to sob at the sight of them until you can hardly stop. You finally manage to regain your composure, but the anguish in your soul remains. The ghostly children seem stuck in a perpetual game of Ring Around the Rosie. They pay you no attention whatsoever as they go about their game over and over. So they're part of a quest, so we'll come back for them. They seem perfectly harmless, but they are ghosts nonetheless. You need to motivate yourself to pull away and leave them behind. I think, so, I am a little bit confused because sometimes we're able to leave ghosts, fine, especially after we communicate with them, which doesn't seem to be correct. It seems like we have to will ourselves to leave even if we're not being harmed by the ghosts in some instances. So I don't understand why sometimes we have to flee and sometimes we can just leave well enough alone. I had meant to change most of the fleeing these encounters to just leave alone, but I did not do so obviously at the moment. So anyway, uh, we I'm babbling. We're gonna go ahead and flee. You gather your strength and turn to walk away. You can still hear their song in your head. You see the outline of its distinctive shape in the gloom. It still takes you a second or two to re realize exactly what it is, a guillotine. This, however, is no normal guillotine. The mouton and blade pulled up high glistens with wet blood, and the basketball seems to beckon to you. You feel tired suddenly, and then you realize that you have somehow unknowingly taken a few more steps towards the death machine. You feel a wave of panic engulf you as you realize that this cruel instrument of death is slowly drawing you closer. You realize that you must resist its siren call, or it's losing sanity and just possibly your head. You will your feet to stand their ground and shield your mind from whatever foul sorcery is at work here. You stand before a work of art, 
Polished brass wood and I'm sorry, polished wood and burnished brass fittings adorn the guillotine. The craftsmanship is astonishing, and the splattered blood detracts from it not at all. You can also feel the arcane curse that has bound an evil spirit to this horrible contraption. How many victims have caught sight of it, only to find themselves sleepwalking to their doom? So this is part of a quest, so we're just gonna leave it alone. So yeah, so this is this is what I'm talking about. Like the thing is was pulling us toward it. But we can just walk away without needing a will check, basically. It's, it's so weird. You sighed that now is not the time to lose your head. It would seem to me like we could easily walk away from the goats, but not the guillotine. I've meant occasionally to change some of the encounters, like the guillotine. I feel like if you fail the horror check, it should throw you into a very dangerous encounter, similar to how the um, green slime works. Suddenly, like, you are putting your head into it. And you need to pass a check to resist it, or or it goes really south on you. Your attention is drawn to the clattering sounds of wood striking wood. You could swear you were hearing wooden shoes scampering around in the gloom in front of you. Suddenly, you see a small group of porcelain dolls scurrying towards you, animated by some strange sorcery or curse. These dolls look angry, and they are armed as well. This isn't something that you see every day. A murderous gang of porcelain dolls heading towards you and obviously intent on spilling your blood. You stand there amazed, caught between panic because of the danger and laughter at the absurdity of the scene. I think we're failing this. Badly. The appearance of these crazed dolls pushes the panic button and you feel your sanity slowly slipping away. The toys jump around you like maniacal goblins looking for treats on Halloween. They swing and jab their blades at you. Oddly, one of the dolls is carrying around a ragged doll of its own. You quickly remember an old case file about an insane toy maker named Henry Stoff who captured children's souls and imprisoned them in toys. Could this be a Stoff collection? You realize this is not going to end well. You are going to have to either fight or flee. So they are they are actually easily fought, which is a bit... Um, a bit of a uh, underhanded thing to do, I feel, in this instance, because they are actually the second part of a quest, so we will leave them alone. You decide to turn and run until you can find a better way to deal with this. You muster all your courage and turn and run the way you came. No, we don't. You stay by yourself in safety. We don't. We, we stay put. We got an evade uh, success. Now, I'm kind of nervous. We haven't gotten a trap yet, and so I'm staring at this spot in particular. It's making me very nervous. I can't avoid it, and the game likes putting traps right on the other side of doorways. Especially in halls. I don't have a good feeling about this step. Ah, screw you! <laughs> screw me too for being right. You're a twang, and look up to see Crossbow Bolt. Cross, is, that, is that its name? You hear a twang, and look up to see Crossbow Bolt heading your way and aimed at your heart. Should be an A there, or the. Oh, we don't have a good chance at this. Your battle instincts kick in, and you drop to the floor and roll away. Okay, it's not a bad hand. We only have one face card, but we the rest of our cards are... We have an eight, two sevens, and a six. Odds are good we can at least reduce the risk of us getting a wound card up here. Whew. I cannot stress enough, everyone, when you play this game, how badly you never want to fail a single trap encounter. Like, never. You never want to fail them. You always want to pass. Because they can give you wound cards or, or ill omens. They are very, very bad to fail against. You drop to the floor and roll, avoiding the lethal bolt. Now on that note, we can get auras of luck from winning these encounters. But odds are we'll gain nothing, because that's the best way the game rolls. Screw you, game. Alright, let's move on. By the way, you, you'll hear me say screw you game pretty often. Uh, this is this is just a natural reaction one should have when they play Cold Chronicles. <laughs> upon not upon passing something like a lockpick challenge or a, a trap and not gaining anything. Hello. Here's the second floor.
Hmm. This must bend it down into the upper foyer and then around the corner. Okay, we're not going to explore the second floor yet. So, I don't, I don't know if I should give, ever give strategy to this game. Occasionally I do. I'm like the only YouTuber that, that plays this game regularly, so maybe I should. So, if you're feeling like your stats are high enough, the second floor has very many locked doors in it. Locked doors are a good way for you to gain auras of fortune, which can really affect you. They, they, I believe auras of, auras of fortune increase the quality of the cards that you flip over. For example, an encounter might not have an arcana card as a reward, but if your luck is high enough, it may change a, a card to such. The same thing, for example, with the uh, edge upgrades. Those are not normally reward cards for some of the encounters that we were earning them in. So, getting a high luck is very important. On that note, ill omens, ill omens are very, very bad. I don't think you're penalized when you have a negative luck. It's just that you're not getting positive luck, so you're not going to get an edge upgrade from an encounter that doesn't have them. I think that's the way that works. Right, we'll finish exploring this hallway first. Hello, crafts room. We have found a clue. You have indications that cultists of some type are active in the mansion. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> we, we we chose that as the mission. We were told there's cultists here. There better damn well be cultists in this place. <laughs> You notice a small pile of junk clearing up a section of the floor. Upon closer examination, you see an assortment of typical cast-off items. Broken pieces of this and that. So this works similarly to the pile of papers. You get one chance to, to search this, so you don't you don't want to fail. And I don't like our odds at the moment. They're they're decent, but I want to have a good target number. I'm oh, sorry. I want to have I want to maybe have one or two more draw before I make the attempts. We'll come back for that. Oh, what the heck? You have come face to face with a green ooze. You didn't even notice it at first. It sticks to the ceiling hidden in the shadows, waiting in ambush. Suddenly, it drops to the floor with a sickening squishing sound and forms up in front of us. You feel the rush of adrenaline field fear sweep over you. This lab experiment gone bad could mean the end of you. This is si It's in a similar spot that it was for our last Sarah Anoa. This is one of those encounters where if you fail to flee or fight it, it goes really bad for you. You struggle to maintain your sanity. You thought that the last of these Lab 257 experiments had been hunted down and destroyed. It seems that you were wrong. You try to recall the warnings from the briefings. This The creature will try and suffocate you by enveloping you in its amorphous slimy tissues. So, we might win a fight, but it's going to be tough. Our target number is 7, and we only have 5 tricks and 5 draw. I would much rather flee, especially because the challenge is only 1. I think, by the way, I think I lowered this target number to help you get away, because how difficult this challenge is. It looks like a creature to me. Like, uh, if I look at the picture, this looks like a head that's facing upwards, like vomiting itself up to the ceiling. This looks like an arm here and a torso being formed. The blob was always one of the most scariest things to me when I was a kid. All right, well, we're fleeing. This isn't a battle that you want to fight right now, so you decide to get away and fight another day. Please give us a swords of some sort up here. Please give us a swords. Please give us a swords. Oh, no. You attempt to run, but the creature lunges for your legs and catches them up in its slimy hold. You might be in trouble now. Game, I hate you. We couldn't even get one point. The green ooze envelops you, and you immediately feel the crushing pressure as the slimy tissues that compose the creature begins to crush down on you. The pain is immense. You must keep the thing from squeezing the breath out of you. You put all your efforts into getting free from the killing grip of the creature. You struggle and squirm, but to no avail. You never saw it coming. You are now just another static statistic in the odd ledger book. Your body will probably never be found. Death is nothing to us, since when we are, death is not come. But when death has come, we are not. 
Well, that was a terrible way to go. <laughs> Just like that, we're wiped out. So I don't feel we should stop there, everyone. I think we should try try this again. Yeah, I think we should try this again. So let's, uh, but I don't have time to record another episode. Because it's dinner time and then playing Dungeons and Dragons this evening. So we will remake Sarah Anawa. We will make this attempt again. We'll be back with more occult crime. everyone. All right, we're back with some more Occult Chronicles. It occurred to me that if I ended the video at 30 minutes, people would probably know that I died or something horrific happened and we threw in the towel for, on that last Sarah. So we're, uh, we're gonna just roll this into the same video so it's at least an hour long. This way, this way keeps the suspense up as to whether or not I survived in the encounters that we're having. So we have remade Sarah, and I actually went and got a good look at the name I'm supposed to be using for her. It's a little anyway. Its real name was Serenata Enoa. So here she is. I love that name. That's fun to say as well. And I made her only once. I didn't have to actually uh, make several attempts to get a character I wanted. We started with a machete. So it's not a dagger, so it weighs a little more. One extra pound. But it gives us plus one swords, as all most all melee items do. Of course, just roll one cups or one swords bone, and chop chop. Select a non-face played card. Oh, played card. Then roll one bone and bump the card value up on the selected card plus X, where X is the number of swords or cups rolled. And it is a combat challenge. We have critical hit. Roll one bone and then select a revealed non-face trick card and bump its card value down minus X. Then add X to so your trick tip points taken scored where X is the number of swords or cups rolled, and then draw a card. Remember, this is a rogue feat, so we can fail if we roll higher than our swords or cups number. This also requires a ranged weapon in order for us to use it. And we have Whirlwind. So I think we had Critical Hit and Whirlwind the last time we started with Sarah. Well, not the last time, but the time before that, the one that got glitched, unfortunately. So Whirlwind is a requires one melee item. Roll one bone and bump the card value up on X random non-face cards in hand, where X is the number of swords or cups rolled, then draw a card. And roll one requires a melee weapon, so we have one with our machete, so we can use that at least. She's starting again with the Cyclone, 60% chance it will show up with the 60% release chance. Our stats are decent, you know, they were what they were last time when we started out. 15 life, which I started with, and we rolled three, I'm sorry, 13 sanity, which we started with, and we rolled five extra life for our character. And for Serenata's edges, she starts with light and reflexes. Again, I want to have a slightly better chance of avoiding traps and blind fighting. Whenever a melee weapon special ability is used, X is added to the bump up applied to any non-face hand cards as a result where X is a random number between one and the level of the edge. So this is useless to us. This does not benefit from machete, which targets played cards, not in hand cards. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started again. And I think we'll start by going to the closer door. We'll check to make sure there's no clue token by the uh, sort of armor. Yes, there can be a clue token in the starting chamber. I've had it happen several times uh, for me. And of course, we're checking the corner for a secret uh, door, but there was none there this time. You hear a twang and look up to see a crossbow bolt headed your way and aimed at your heart. And immediately we're presented with a trap. You react immediately, twisting to dodge the deadly projectile. Oh, we got a good hand at least. But we'll have to hope for a wands card showing up here, and it one did. Wow. And that was the only card we were able to take as well. Thank goodness we had a king in our hand. You twist hard to one side and feel the breeze as the bolt narrowly misses you and flies by within a few inches. An experience card already. We'll go ahead and begin working on our cups increase again. 
I'm, I'm going to save the game immediately. <laughs> it's not every day you survive a crossbow bolt being flung at you as the first encounter in the game. Holy crap. A reading room. I see books are all... Wow, books are in a giant pile here. A book is next to the lounge chair. And there's a chair over here with books open next to it. You see a large marble fireplace decorated with ornate sculptures, but what really astonishes you is the burning fire within the hearth. The flames dance around and lick the walls of the fireplace, almost as if it were some type of living entity. Then it strikes you. A demonic face appears in the flames, and the sudden realization that this creature has noticed you sends a wave of horror rolling over you. You struggle to keep calm and not give in to panic. You're looking straight in the face of some sort of flaming evil horror. It seems to dominate your mind, and you know that you must not let that happen. Your will is stronger than this evil creature of flame. You force it out of your mind and hold on to your sanity. The fire... The face in the fire smiles at you. The demonic creature must have been bound to the fireplace. How long ago and by whom are questions that you cannot answer. You cautiously step forward so that you can examine the situation in more detail. The demon seems contained within the hearth, but you have not, no idea how strong his binding there is. So just as before, we have an okay chance to bargain with the demon. But if that goes bad, things go bad for us very quickly. But I think we're, we're starting early enough. We'll make the attempt. And that we have a decent attempt to succeed at this as well. It's not like we're going to have an increase in pentacles anytime soon, nor uh, wands for that matter. So we'll, we'll, let's, let's try it. Something strange is going on here. You sense the opportunity to communicate with the demon and perhaps figure out how it was bound here and for what purpose. You attempt to communicate with the demon but are at a loss on how to break through. You push too aggressively and are assaulted with a burst of flame for your efforts. The flames roar from the fireplace as the creature seems to take form in front of you. You smell sulfur and brimstone and realize that the demon intends to do you harm. You know when you are outclassed and this is it. Run as fast as you can. You manage to escape with only your pride wounded a tiny bit. Remember, never, ever select a single card from the flea victories that you get. The only thing you'll get as a reward is losing courage from your heroic feats. So, this is more like the start I expected for Sarah for the past two times as well. The failure to get to complete the quests, given how difficult uh, they can be. A locked door. You see a locked wooden door. There is a worn keyhole right where it belongs, but no sign of a key anywhere. I don't like these odds. A three target with four tricks and four draw is very bad for us. Because if we fail this, we can get some an ill omen card. I think we hold off on this until we can maybe get one more cups point. You decide to leave the door alone. Probably a good choice. Well, that's oh, but say that's all there is on this side of the house, but no, we can go up that what that hallway. A ballroom. Some strange markings are all over the chamber. Suddenly in front of you materialize a group of figures dressed in suits and evening gowns, waltzing with partners unhappily around the room. The surprise appearance from thin air catches you off guard and startles you. This ghostly ball is quite disconcerting, even though the ghosts seem to be unaware of your presence. You struggle to keep a rein on any fears that would chip away at your sanity. You have kept your sanity. You proceed with your trademark ineffable composure. The deathly scene, uh, the deathly silence that encompasses this ghostly ball strikes you as odd. Although the ghosts themselves seem oblivious to your presence, you feel a definite tension in the air. The ghosts themselves seem quite displeased about something. It doesn't appear to have anything to do with you. Then you realize what's so odd. 
none of the ghosts start dancing. They just start to partner up, but then each time the dance is set to begin, nothing happens. You decide to use your training as a medium to make contact and find out what seems to be troubling them. There is always a risk with this type of action. You do your best to get the attention of the ghosts, even psychically tapping on a gentleman's shoulder at one point, but to no avail. Soon your head begins to ache. We'll try that again. You make the rounds from a couple to couple until you find one that wants to talk. There seems to be a problem with the ball. Maybe you can help. The ghost explained that the band will not play without its pianists. A pianist, and they have no idea where the fellow is. You hear a chubby old monocle-wearing ghost sitting near the wall chuckle. <laughs> With his piano, of course. You contemplate the ghost's meaning, and you suspect that a piano will indeed be the key to this mystery. If I get an ill omen from this wooden door, I'm going to be really upset. <laughs> I get an ill omen so early in the game is so... Such a crippling thing to happen. Happen to your character. We'll, we'll try to get one up in cups. Get an extra trick. I don't like this. I'm feeling another trap. We have another door here. A locked secret door. You've discovered a secret wooden door. It blends in almost seamlessly with the wall, but your keen senses were still able to detect it. Finding it is one thing. Figuring out how to open it is another. We have a decent chance at this, actually. This probably, I would imagine, leads downstairs. But again, I think I would rather wait until our stats are higher. One more pentacles in this case. You decide to leave the secret door alone. Some secrets are dangerous, and this may be one of those. There are plenty of other rooms and corridors to explore. Holy crap, there's a ton of encounters in this room. Your attention is drawn to a magnificent grandfather clock that dominates its section of the room. Constructed out of rich mahogany, its exterior is decorated with ornate friezes and carvings. Its large brass pendulum hangs motionless, but frozen oddly at a slight angle. You've had your fair share of encounters with possessed or cursed furniture, and you don't sense anything supernatural here. There's something strange, however. An aura or an energy of some sort is being hidden here. It is hard, though, not to be awestruck by the quality of the craftsmanship that went into building the clock. Perhaps it is meant as a distraction. You decide to pursue this another time. Good, good pun. You feel your foot step down on the pressure plate, and then hear the pneumatic sounds of darts being shot through blow tubes. You catch a glimpse of the deadly swarm of needle tip killers heading your way. Oh. You react without thinking, tucking into an acrobatic duck and roll. Well... We failed this. Because we've got an ace. We got two aces, two threes, and a page of wands, and there's no way we can get the score we need. You tumble but choose the wrong direction. You might regret this. Thank God. <laughs> I thought for sure we were going to get a wound from failing that trap. You see the figure of a woman silhouetted against the wall. You call out, Who's there? but get no response. You almost wonder if it might be a mannequin of some sort. A sudden chill envelops you as you step closer. The shape shifts and turns to face you, revealing the outlines of smoky wings that unfold and then flit in and out of the darkness. Your eyes wide in disbelief as you confront what is obviously a winged woman of some sort. You think it must be a succubus. Your mind strains to comprehend the demonic creature that stands before you. We've seen her before, we know as well by now, well, maybe, maybe we don't know by now, but I know by now, that this is Fall from Grace from the Plainsky Torment series. Your mind is strong. You see things far worse than this. I would hope so, it's just a woman with wings to us at the moment. Yes, you decide this is most surely a succubus. You remember your odd training in dealing with minor demonics. You must be on your toes here. She will try and manipulate you into doing something rash, no doubt. 
She looks upon you with the saddest eyes that you think you have ever seen. She seems to want to speak with you, but we cannot speak with her. And so we'll try to flee. You will yourself to turn and run. You muster all your willpower and soon are away from it. Oh, don't you dare flip over cards, Tim. A tall, well-dressed figure looms into view, holding a silver platter in one hand as if to offer you an appetizer. Your eyes travel down to the platter and behold half a human head. You feel a surge of panic growing within you. You've been trained to expect and deal with things like this. Even so, no matter how many times you see something like it, it still requires steady nerves to keep calm. You can't keep the growing feelings of horror at bay. This encounter is definitely heading in the wrong direction. Standing in front of you is the figure of what was obviously once a butler or servant. You say once because you are sure that what now confronts you is a supernatural entity of some sort. It is the most corporeal ghost that you have ever encountered. You have read of such things in Tobin's spirit guide, but you are certain that this is very unusual. As you approach the butler, and his glowing eyes are fixed on you. Wait, you approach the butler and his glowing eyes are fixing you, okay. The head on the plate suddenly stares up at you as well. May I help you, sir? It intones, and you are not sure if you actually heard its voice in your ears, or just in your head. You decide to use your psychic talents as a medium to converse with the butler. Despite his ghastly dinner tray, he seems harmless enough. We'll just fail that automatically. You fail to get anywhere with the seemingly corporeal apparition. Your head aches from the attempt. I want a face card. Okay, that's acceptable. Nice, 12 points. Despite his calm demeanor, the seemingly corporeal apparition of the butler is quite distressed. It seems the chef has botched preparation of the master's dessert. He desires your help. The butler wants you to go find the chef in the kitchen and order him to prepare the master's dessert again. He says that the master will be pleased and promises to reward you if you help him out. That two experience points was a very nice acquisition. Plus one cups. That should make traps a little easier. We might be able to succeed at some of the doors that we try to unlock now with plus one more trick. Unfortunately, I don't intend to take anything that can increase our wands stat. So... We're not going to get more of a card draw or a lower target number from the doors. Suddenly, you see the dim glow of a formless ghost just ahead of you. It seems to just hang in the air. It may be the most basic of spectral creatures, an uninformed psychokinetic disturbance, but it's a spirit all the same and would frighten any flesh and blood human. Well, not Serenetta. Sorry, Serenata. The haunting manifests itself as a dim ball of light. It has no sense of its previous life or existence. It wanders hopelessly lost. You should exercise caution. These haunts cannot be reasoned with, and they can be lethal if disturbed. So we will get her. That's it. That's the whole plan. Get her. It's actually harder for us to flee because we took plus one cups. The game has made it a little harder. Screw you, game modifier. So we're going to try to fight her instead. It's a little easier to win the fight than it is to flee from it. I'm going to use an 8 and hope we can use a king on a better card. And I was wrong. You got her good. No one's ever going to believe how you did it. And you're not sure you are either. A locked door. So we can just go back down to the grandfather clock to get out of the room. I, w I, Tim, you're not gonna get on. Uh, you're not gonna get wand cards. But I could get more draw with a with a sword. We could always try just bashing the doors in rather than picking the locks. Though at the moment I feel picking the locks is easier than bashing the door in. Oh, I hear my, my dinner going off. All right, everyone. So we're going to go down this hallway, investigate what's in these two rooms, and then we'll call the session.
And I'm thinking we'll, pr we'll probably double back and try the doors in the next episode. Maybe we can get some auras of luck. Oh my goodness, that's... Pr this is either a Talisrati or it's a man-eating plant. Uh, it could be the statues. Which can show up in this room. For and I hate seeing encounters on the, right on the other side of the doors. Alright, but we'll stop here. Alright, everyone, so thank you guys for watching. And we will pick up with Serenata Inawa in the next video. I will see you guys then. Take care, everyone.